So the purpose of this conversation today is not quite to talk about banking, but to talk about leadership, because we are a school of general management and a school of leadership. And uh, we're very privileged this evening to be talking to, uh, to be learning from certainly one of my heroes. Um, in, by way of introduction, funny, um, I, I followed you when uh, you, you were doing amazing stuff at Kahisa. I thought, wow, when I grow up, I want to be funny, right? Um, and then you moved on, you went into TISA, right? And then our paths organizationally crossed a little bit when Momentum and Metropolitan came together because you had a shareholding in the Metropolitan business, right? Um, but then, of course, you moved on um, and went to Investec uh, initially as joint CEO, when you went back after your retirement, <laughs> and, and eventually as the group CEO. Um, and there's a whole host of other businesses and companies that are really inspiring that you've been involved in. And, and so it's not a surprise that somebody as young as I am, yes, we might both not have hair, but I'm <laughs> significantly younger. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, I just want people to understand that uh, um, there's respect here, and I, I'm showing the appropriate respect. But funny, I don't want to start where you are. I want to start right at the beginning, um, that as one who came from a large family. Um, what are some of the leadership lessons? I don't know if it's true. They say you're one of 14 children. Yeah, that's right. Th that's right. Um, so let's start there. What are some of the leadership lessons? I mean, um, I, I, I thought I came from a big family. That's five children from my mother. I think there are other children from another mother, but <laughs> <laughs> certainly from my mother, <laughs> five children. So, and I learned some leadership lessons in that context. Yep. Can you share some of your leadership lessons as one of 14? Uh, good evening, uh, everyone, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor, for the invitation. Uh, as I walked in, I remembered my days some years ago when I did an MBA, and we used to have uh, colleagues from industry come in to talk about their experiences. So it was a bit surreal, uh, but thank you for, for the invitation. I suppose um, leadership, as you say, is something that you continue to develop throughout your life. So as an example, in my early days, because we were a pretty large family, the idea that uh, my life was not only about me, but about the interests of the broader family, was uh, an idea that uh, took root pretty early uh, in life. Um, understanding that your interests uh, do not um, supersede the interests of others and that common interest is important. Um, I came from a, a pretty large family, a very poor family, born on a farm uh, in the free state. Uh, and uh, my father could only a read or write, uh, two years, substandard bead was called. In those years, my mother uh, could not read or write. And yet, in their very desires for their children, different as they were, uh, you learned a sense of aspiration. My father was very uh, optimistic, uh, really believed in uh, the power of positive thinking, the power of possibility. My mother, on the other hand, was quite um, protective of her kids, very strict, a disciplinarian. So learned at that time that you need both uh, the optimism and the inspiration of uh, a future uh, that you want to work towards, but you need the discipline uh, of work uh, to really do what, what, what is necessary. So those three areas of, of personal learning and leadership have set me well in life. A sense of hope and optimism and possibility on the one hand uh, and, and knowledge that uh, you have to be disciplined and there's a price and a sacrifice to make. And thirdly, uh, the fact that it is not only about me, uh, that um, you have to have uh, um, an understanding of common interest, a common future, a common destiny. That's powerful in terms of connecting to the purpose-driven leadership that 
you continue to have within Investec, when I look at people, I often wonder what you must have looked like when you were 11 years old. <laughs> and, and what were your aspirations? So when we teach students, I, I, from time to time I'm thinking, this person is sounding polished, but what did their 11 year old self look like and sound like and what was their aspiration? So I wonder if I could put that question to you, 11 year old you. Where were you exactly in the geographic space? And standard, man, not grades, because we didn't have grades then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what standard were you in? And, and what were your aspirations as a, a young 11-year-old boy? Um, 11 years, um, I was out in uh, the Free State, um, a little town uh, called Wernberg between... Uh, um, Kruenstedt and Bloemfontein on a farm um, and we were the only family on, on that particular um, out, out farm so a fairly uh, circumscribed set of uh, living conditions uh, being on a farm and that was the future uh, for, for a guy like me, I would have uh, probably looked after cattle I would probably have worked in the field or oh, I would, uh, the, the, the highest rank in, in those days, you guys won't believe this, was uh, being a driver of a tractor that is really an expert. You can drive it straight as you, as you start to, uh, to, to, um, to sow, and you can drive it straight when you start uh, to, to harvest. So that was the pinnacle of, uh, of um, uh, what I thought life could offer. But you're still a truck driver, tractor driver today. Just your uh, tractor is, is a beautifully <laughs> branded tractor <laughs> called Investec. <laughs> In a sense. <laughs> so you didn't quite disappear from that legacy of being a driver. <laughs> um, but you somehow didn't stick to the script. I suppose, um, and this is what I, I generally advise younger people to do. Um, not to think too far ahead um, and put stress on, on, on your life. As, as it happens, the year after my 11th, my father had a bit of a, uh, shall we say, a kerfuffle and a, <laughs> a bit of a scrap with uh, the farm owner. He had had too many of them. So in the, in the neighboring... Uh, uh, so you speak land, Yiddish now, kerfuffle? Okay, continue. Yeah, got you, it, got you. <laughs> so in the neighboring... Um, uh, farmland or couldn't get a job anywhere. As it happens, uh, the Nationalist Party had designed this most brilliant plan called separate development, uh, which, in, which meant that uh, black people generally would uh, be divided by tribe so that uh, the, the nationalists would be able to continue to rule over black people because they're divided. Being a southern so to speaker, we went to a little place called Kwakwa, which was a homeland for the So let's see if Southern the people speaking. can. Can you guys say kwa kwa? <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> for my white compatriots, the <laughs> trick is to have your tongue right at the back of your palate. <laughs> That's how you do it. It's not too difficult. Uh, so, I mean, as you would know, for those who were possess, you would get shipped out to Transkai. For those who were paddies or spoke paddy, you would be shipped out to Lebo Homo Cyril, and his guys would uh, have Venda <laughs> as uh, their place of, uh, of permanent citizenship. So in essence, as that one door closed... So you, you, you were South opened. African, then you went South African. Yeah. You lost your citizenship, and, and you went to a new country called Kwakwa. It was not quite a country like Buputatswana or Transkei, but it was on the, on the road there. Okay. So the lesson for me was, uh, while there may well be a setback, um, and there may be a, a disruption of a future that you see, and do you think a particular door closes, life is always so amazing that other doors do open. So what would have happened uh, in uh, 1974, when I was 12, that was the year in which I would have gone into the farm labor system permanently. Do you know 1974 was a wonderful year? <laughs> like, you the most boy. important year <laughs> of my life. 
I can't imagine. <laughs> That's the of your life. <laughs> so I would have not had any other opportunity to further my education. Uh, so went through to Kwakwa, started off there, and thankfully I could then go into Standard 5. That was a pivotal moment because I could get to study, and uh, here we are. About 900 and between 920 and 980,000 students sit for their final year of school, grade 12, every year. Uh, and so we know this year, I think it's about 920,000. Last year of that number, uh, in a world that is increasingly complex and digital and so forth, only about 50,000 passed with a B and upper in mathematics, right? So basically, less than 3% of our matriculants passed with a B in maths in 2022. And this has been a quite a consistent trend for the past 20-odd years. And yet some farm boy from Kwakwa decides he wants to study mathematics, Help us to understand where that comes from. Um, if I knew, I would, <laughs> I would be lying. <laughs> but surely, I, I mean, think, uh, uh, do you come from a family of undercover mathematicians? Uh, <laughs> not quite. <laughs> not quite. I, I think it's a combination of a number of things. Um, I think each one of us gets born with a particular set of attributes. Um, and ours is to find those attributes and to cultivate them to, to be the best we can be. Uh, second, we require an environment that can support the development of the nascent gifts and talents uh, that we have. Uh, in my case, um, I, I was born with an orientation towards medicine and science. Um, I uh, had a family that had a structure and one of the greatest uh, uh, destructions of uh, the apartheid movement at the time was that families were not together. So while farms were uh, pretty uh, rough in those days, but there was an integrity of a family structure. You had uh, a father and mother. If there was a problem with uh, a roof that gets blown away, in August there's, a, there's somebody who can fix it. There's a mother who can uh, instill discipline. So the cultivation of the nascent gifts I had uh, became much more possible because of that family structure that was there. The destruction of family structures is one of the things we have to deal with as a country because you grow up in societies where, firstly, there are no role models. Second, there isn't an example of what uh, a life should be of a, of a young child. Thirdly, there are so many households that are child-headed and the levels of poverty are quite high. So uh, in my case, born with certain gifts, uh, lucky that uh, I grew up in a family where there were uh, the two parents, and of course we had siblings, and we were able to develop whatever gifts uh, that we had. I mean, when we got to metric, uh, we uh, were taught by somebody who had metric, but there was a structure uh, that could support. So they just repeat, your ma your your teacher at school, their highest qualification yeah, yeah, yeah. was matric. And they were teaching you to get their highest qualification. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Clock that. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, that's, been, uh, that's been the journey. So when I look at my own journey, my own level of uh, achievement or lack of it, I always compare myself only to myself. Um, because the gifts and capabilities and abilities I have, I was born with. I was born into a family that helped me uh, to have a particular uh, structure that allowed me to, uh, to be successful. So the only comparison is about the opportunity I had and what I've done with it. Uh, so I'd never compare myself with you, uh, <laughs> uh, the professor, because you've done a lot, a lot better than I could ever do. But I haven't had a Fulbright scholarship. <laughs> okay, I nice. haven't been to UC Berkeley. 
<laughs> I don't have a UC Berkeley on my CV as a degree. Small little university on the west coast <laughs> of the US. <laughs> Which is uh, uh, responsible for some of the big giant tech companies that rule the world. So let's just kind of Has take things... Has anyone watched Oppenheimer? In perspective. Go for it, yeah. The film? Yeah. Okay, this guy... Um, the, the development of the atomic bomb was done um, in the uh, Berkeley area. There's what is called a, a Lawrence Berkeley laboratory. Uh, so the scientists were around there in my place. The laboratory is part of the university system. So unfortunately, so, so did you contribute? with education, you do get... <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, you do get some of these destructive outcomes <laughs> as much as technology is good. But let's stay a little bit um, in Berkeley in addition to furthering your education, did you learn anything else beyond the university that contributed to who you are today in that west coast of the United States? I mean, obviously, I'm quite distraught at uh, what's happened to the U.S. now, a divided country, post-truth, um, a country that does not uh, necessarily believe in the best of values, just given the epoch we are in now. So the America I went to in the early 80s, when some of you may not have been around. Did you, have to, get a, did you have to get a permission from some minister to leave the country? Not quite. Not so, it, quite. so it was getting better. Yeah, it was getting okay. better. Middle 80s. Middle 80s. So coming from, a, firstly, a very restricted society, because I have got... Uh, uh, highly controlled information was very much limited. Uh, you couldn't, I mean, you could be uh, imprisoned for reading an article that had uh, the name ANC on it. Literally, uh, for you it may sound it may sound like uh, uh, like uh, hyperbole, but that is the truth. And very segregated. Uh, so the the first time I get to to Berkeley um, uh, around August of 86. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, Just to West put it Coast. in context, South Africa is burning in 86. I know. Right? So just understand where he's coming from. Uh, we've had a guy called South African problems will be solved by South Africans <laughs> and not by foreigners. <laughs> the Hood Crocodile. Right? He's had his Rubicon speech and yeah. has taken us back. Right? And so this is your context and you leave and you go to that very strange part of the world. Continue. So the first uh, Marvel was uh, a society that is open and where nothing is taken necessarily as dogma. So you get into uh, into university, even the existence of God, as we assumed here um, in the country that uh, that was a, a given, was not a given anymore um, uh, within a university system. So the openness uh, to, to challenge, to think differently, to be yourself was probably the most important discovery of a different society. Uh, obviously, the lack of uh, uh, racial, at least legalized, uh, or legally enforced racial separation uh, was uh, uh, something that was particularly uh, interesting as well. The level of uh, technology that uh, um, you got exposed to was interesting. So it was a, a, a complete, a completely new world, a world that could be discovered, a world that could be experienced, and it was uh, it was fantastic. Um, still, I, I went out on a one-year ticket. So the only way you could go home was uh, 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 through an aircraft. And from time to time, from San Francisco International Airport, you see an aeroplane go up and say, goodness me, when do I ever get to go back home? I could only speak to my mom about uh, once every week or every second week. And she had to walk uh, from the village about uh, three, four uh, kilometers to get to a place where there was a telephone. So a contrast of a highly technologically advanced world, an open society, uh, as we had it at that time, against a restricted, a very segregated, and in fact a very oppressive country. So two worlds, but really an opportunity to experience life differently. 
like the rest of us, let me rather say, the most of us in this room, yeah. why didn't you want to be an employee? Why did you want to be an entrepreneur? Um, but let me just trace um, my, my career history a little bit because let me give you a sense of perspective. Um, so when I finished my studies, I went into teaching mathematics because coming out of a, a large family, my father was actually a patriarch, so not only did we have our immediate family, we had a number of other families with us. So sustenance was really quite important. So in, in our growing up, uh, on an average day, you would have a, a pup maybe with salt, sometimes pup with uh, sugar, sometimes with water and sugar. So the idea of getting out of that as quickly as possible and the idea of getting a job that was much safer uh, was attractive. So safety of uh, tenure uh, and uh, the ability to start to look after family. So I went into teaching because that was the safest uh, of those routes. After a period of five years of teaching, I felt I could do um, a bit more interesting stuff with my life. I had started to repeat what I taught the previous year. <laughs> that I started to get a little, uh, a little difficult. So I thought, look, uh, what would I like to do? I, I've been fortunate in life to get an education. I've been um, uh, able to go overseas. I've had an expansion in my life view uh, through my exposure to the U.S., particularly the West Coast. What would I like to do? So I decided... I'm not going to be a mathematics teacher for the rest of my life. I would like to get into a space that is a little broader where you work with um, a lot of variety and, uh, and you work with a lot of people. If you're into mathematics and you do research, you get narrower and narrower and narrower as you go. The people you can talk to become fewer and fewer. That's what specialization can do. So I decided I'd like to go into business. I remember at that time, um, already married uh, with, uh, with the child, and it was a, it was a, a difficult life choice. Uh, but I've, I've always had this sense that you've got to take some risk uh, for there to be progress and for you to, uh, to achieve some of the, the urgings you, you develop inside of you. So cashed in everything I had, um, uh, went to, uh, to business school, and uh, at that time, uh, uh, asked my, uh, my wife then to go back uh, to her people, her <laughs> family, because I wanted to study. So that was an important part of, part of life. Uh, went in for two years, then uh, started. So I experienced uh, for a period of four or five years um, the sense of working for others. And what was important was that, and this is, this is really important for young people, that you were to have a particular skill that you bring, a contribution you can make. Um, you have to have a passion about uh, what it is that lights your fire. Why do you wake up every morning? And you have to have a desire to contribute further and beyond your own circle. Can you make an impact in life beyond you? So these, these are the things that have driven uh, my progress in life. So Going into my own business, having gained um, experience over a period of time, worked for RMB, worked for the development bank, then got an opportunity to work at Cajiso in a private equity environment. When I got into that environment for the first time in my working life, I had a confluence of my skills, my passion being investing at the time, and uh, a sense of a greater purpose. So in life, I generally say, look for a skill and a contribution you can make, the passion to do that, potentially even if you didn't get paid, and possibly that's why I work uh, here. Impact. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get okay. I'll talk to my shareholders. Maybe just increase your fee. So that was it. Um, uh, in, so I found my calling, as it were. This is what I'm going to do. I, I love being on my own. I love the challenge to either uh, succeed or fail. When I left uh, teaching at university, an old professor of mine said, uh, my boy, you're going into a risky environment. You are likely to come back here with your tail uh, 
between your legs. Uh, for a, 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 a black person like you, industry is not going to be accepting. So the sense of risk, the desire to succeed, and the desire to be on my own. When you own your own business, the buck literally stops with you. So in the first year, when we started our own business, having worked at Kachiso, having built a brand a capability and an ability to raise money, uh, we wanted to start a business to, with two of my friends. So we tried to go bank seven and a half million that we raised to start Tiso. And uh, we couldn't, it was difficult. Where is the money from? What are you <laughs> going to do with it? We tried buy a fax machine. We didn't want to pay cash for it. We wanted to rent a fax machine and rent a printer. No, your business, okay, can you give us three months bank statements? But we are starting. We don't have any bank statements. We have to sign personal sureties. For a fax machine. Yeah, anything and everything you do. So I love smaller environments uh, where you have to do every single thing. From buying coffee, getting um, a fax machine, signing a personal charity to get a, a photocopy. That experience was absolutely beautiful. But we had complete control of our destiny. And there's no better fulfillment if you want to create something of value than being there in the, uh, in, in the fire, as it were, and trying to build something. So over uh, a seven, eight year period, we built a business of significance and substance. And that got me into investing. So you have these opportunities in life. And you have uh, uh, those that open by chance. Uh, I say this to a lot of my colleagues. Success is a funny thing. I mean, first and foremost, you've got to get what I talked about right. Um, skill and, and the level of contribution, passion, uh, and purpose. But you also need to be lucky. <laughs> Luck plays a great role uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the life of uh, uh, individuals. Of course, you've got to work hard, as Gary Player says, to be luckier. You've got to be prepared. You've got to be at, uh, uh, in the field. You can't score a try if you're not in the field. So you're going to be in the field. You've got to have your, uh, your sleeves up. And you've got to fall from time to time. And I've made many mistakes, and I've failed uh, a few times. But the deep and burning desire to be successful, to make a contribution, to have impact. The, the word I would like you to reflect on before we go to the second word, which is failure, is doubt. Mm -hmm. um, because you speak, you've been speaking about taking a risk. You've been speaking about getting lucky. You've been speaking about getting, being in control. And with all the endowments and the benefits of all of those, I, I wonder, does doubt ever creep in? And how do, what do you do with that doubt? Um, sometimes uh, more than I would like to, uh, to accept that I, I do develop doubts. Five years ago, I got given the opportunity, as you know, to lead Investec as uh, the chief executive. I always leave the old part because an officer sounds military and command and control. <laughs> Brett knows I, I like <laughs> chief executive without the old. <laughs> so I followed a founder who had been in the business for 40 years, somebody who is larger than life, the most complete banker the country has had um, in its uh, existence. And here comes this guy with a, a bit of an interesting background. Um, how do you succeed? So, and at the time, we hadn't performed well as a business. The markets are caning us. And um, develop a plan. Uh, I mean, worked hard, extremely hard to develop a plan to uh, get the business to work well. But I must tell you, convincing the team and presenting the core ideas that the team and I would work on. I didn't think necessarily that um, uh, they would be supportive. Some of them are better bankers than I am. Richard Wainwright uh, is a great banker. Uh, somebody like a Kieran Whelan, a great private banker. They would know in those areas more than I would. But again, uh, leadership is about bringing teams together, 
defining a common destiny, uh, a, a destination, a direction of travel, and organizing around this team, having agreed what you're going for, resources, and, and providing the space for people to bring their talents. So I brought this team together. So a lot of doubt getting the team to uh, agree and co-develop a, a plan. Uh, when we went to Cape Town to see our shareholders in London, to see our shareholders say, here's the best for plan uh, for the next uh, five years. We're going to do A, B, C, D. These are the outcomes that we think we can get in five years. But so that you don't wait for five years, we will give you a medium-term uh, milestone uh, to measure success. Um, uh, so, at every one of these meetings, you look into a shareholder's eye, and you can only be filled with doubt. <laughs> I mean, I remember one of the larger shareholders, they own about 7 8% of the business in Cape Town. The guy says, man, I love the way you're talking about it. You're talking about the cost of equity, and you're talking about getting a return above the cost of equity. And the guy says, I like it, but goodness me, I think your plans are unrealistic. I mean, having, having uh, uh, put a, a proper presentation and having been passionate about it, <laughs> the guy says, I like it, but looks unrealistic, chum. So at every one of those moments, uh, you get a sense of doubt. When I left uh, teaching at university, and a, an older guy, somebody that I idolized, says to me, are you sure this is what you want to do? You are likely to come back to me with your tail between your legs. For me, it is absolutely natural. You know who tells you that they don't get doubtful, they don't get a sense of fear um, uh, when they undertake a big project? Uh, they are probably being a little foreign to the truth. But what <laughs> the most successful do, they prepare well, they back themselves to execute on the plan that they have in place, and um, they go for it. Sometimes they don't succeed. We have succeeded with the team that we have now beyond every measure that we put out in February 2019. We had what we called a capital markets uh, day. Uh, some of you, I uh, know, let me uh, have the elephant in the room. Some of you thought that I got paid nicely uh, last year. <laughs> <laughs> just to you don't the have to ask the that question. He's room. just asked it himself. <laughs> <laughs> so when we agreed with our shareholders, uh, what the battle plan was. We also said, uh, if we achieve this particular outcome, you're going to reward our people this way. And a lot of that reward was tied to, to the share price. So we were able to get, depending on the measure you use, around four times uh, the share price we started off with. So if you got given, as, as I was, and I'm not talking about this too much, I'm just trying to give you a sense of success. If you got given a million pounds, that turns into four million pounds, and, and, and it, it feels like it's a lot of money. But it's executing on a plan and uh, tying your own fate and the fate of your colleagues. And by the way, all my colleagues that invested, they didn't make the headlines, but they, they, they were all right. <laughs> Mara Brafani, you mean you were given a million pounds, and it became four million? Yeah. I know that's good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not magic. Okay? Um, so this thing called doubt. I lost doubt, my thought a little bit. I apologize. We'll bring you back. This Thank thing you. called doubt, today we call it imposter syndrome. Yeah. And you are using a more recent example to explain how you are navigating that doubt. Uh, so not everybody is uh, as old as we are. You know, I see one or two people, Dr. Lamberti there. Is our age, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Mark is being kind. <laughs> Most of the people here did, did not grow up in the world of standards. They grew up in yeah. the world of grades. Yes. And they were born digital. So for them, so put yourself in a 30-year-old's shoe. Mm -hmm. And so as a young person, as a 30-year-old in business, in Kajiso, uh, how did you manage doubt? Because mm -hmm. the stakes were very different then, right? Compared to the stakes now, because I think that will be... Stakes are a bit bigger now. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Yeah, it's bigger, but I think the intensity was different given yeah. your age then, right? Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, I've always uh, taken as a, a North Star this idea, as I said earlier, about a set of skills that allow you. They give you a license to be at the table and working harder than anyone else and uh, uh, trying to, to, uh, to make an impact. So that's been uh, my guiding uh, star, as it were. Uh, in the early days of a career, um, because you really haven't gotten the three spheres uh, together nicely, I encourage young people to really seek to get to a point where they reach a sense of certainty about what it is they feel is important for them, and it's an area where they can make a big contribution. So in the early days, and, and I say this to young people, uh, you have to guard your confidence with everything you have. If within a working environment, you don't feel like you have the right level of confidence, and you don't feel that uh, the contribution you're making is either appreciated or um, uh, if it's satisfactory for you, I encourage you to move and look for something else. Because if your confidence gets destroyed, you are likely to struggle in life. The next job becomes even more difficult. So in the early years, uh, from say 25 to about 30, 35. That's called you, youth in this country. Yeah, uh, youth. Yeah. <laughs> so I encourage people to experiment a bit. And if they do not feel they're in the right space, they should move on. Don't let doubt and a sense of uh, not being enough, because this, this is what doubt brings into you. I'm not enough for this role. I'm not good enough. Uh, get on with it. Look for a place. Look for a, a role where you're good enough. But you have to get, I think in middle 30s to, to your 40s, you have to get to a place where you wake up in the morning with a sense of a burning passion and where you have discovered at last what it is you're good at. So, so find that, um, and, and that allows you to, to conquer the doubt. When you know what you know and what you really are passionate about, even if the mountain looks quite steep to climb, there will be something inside of you that says, yeah, the mountain may be quite steep, but boy, do I have it in me. To conquer. And you're when the you're ox. Slip and you, you still fall, have a lot in your you, tank. You keep, you, you keep <laughs> going. So doubt is, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it, it, uh, even at 30, it, it is something that should motivate you and, and continue to fuel you. Even today, having been as successful as, as we have been as, as Investec, we're asking the question, what's next for Investec for the next five, seven years? How do we create the kind of impact and legacy that you don't need to defend. So over the last two years, we worked on a deeper understanding of the meaning of our corporate. Um, because, I mean, I've talked about returns, I've talked about uh, pay and money. Um, so we've had to ask what the French would call the raison d'etre. What is, what is your actual uh, reason to be. Um, uh, do you fulfill in society a particular specific purpose uh, that if you were not there, your clients would miss you and they would wish you remained uh, relevant to them? So we've asked that question for two years. We've spoken to probably uh, more than two, three thousand of, of our colleagues, if not more, uh, so that we can distill for ourselves something that binds us together as an organization, and we came up to this simple idea, really simple, that we exist to create enduring worth. So we want to make a difference, we want to be long-term, and we are multi-stakeholder. In other words, we have a duty of care and loyalty to our people, we have a duty of care and loyalty to our clients, we have a responsibility to the environment that we reduce harm and do good. We have a duty to be ethical in how we operate, pay our taxes. And some of you will know that uh, we have been involved in some controversy around paying taxes in Europe. 
and we've uh, we've had to deal with that controversy, and we continue to work with the, the regulators out uh, in Europe uh, to reckon with what may have happened there. But you have to have a fundamental commitment to doing what's right uh, as a as a corporate, and you have to, as as our predecessor said, you have to live in society and not off it. When financial services people, bankers, fund managers, rich organizations, we've been called worse, okay? <laughs> talk the talk uh -huh. that you are talking. The millions of South Africans that are poor, um, not part of the bargain, mm -hmm. struggle to believe and to buy into that vision. Yeah. Um, how do we respond to, at best, the skeptical, at worst, the cynical? Because they're saying all of this is marketing talk, right? You are driven by profit. You want to make as much profit. You want to be as rich as possible. At our cost, your bank charges are too high. <laughs> by the way, uh, from Coco, I got this little... <laughs> <laughs> this little message from one of my family say, Yo, people were quite interested in this big pay. <laughs> and the question was, why are bank charges so high? Is it because you're <laughs> getting paid so much? <laughs> there we go. Good question. So did, yeah. did, did, did that transformation of the one to four, was that as a result of some unequal relationship that takes place between banks and their customers, between financial institutions, yeah. and society. Yeah, I think this is where you have to understand the concept of enduring worth. In other words, you make decisions not only for today, um, uh, because you have uh, the pressure to make profits. When we went to our shareholders in 2019, we said to them, we have a five-year view around how we would turn the business around. It wasn't uh, a quick scheme to make profits to them, equally we said to them, these are the things that are important to us. Investic used to be known for the slogan, we live in society, not of it. Even before we were around, we were already investing in math and science education. We are the single biggest investor in quality maths and science education in townships. Where our programs are, you can see in a province like the Free State, which we worked with for the last 10 years or so, you can see the progress in medicine science from the Free State given the investment we have made. So I think judge us by what we have done. And because we talk the way we do, hold us to account for what we do. The poorest have been ill-served by a government, I'm not going to politics, that is... This is a safe place to <laughs> criticize yeah. uh, no, politicians. No, no, no. We won't tell them, I promise. No, I get, uh, <laughs> I get whipped too many times for speaking my mind, but we're on a burning platform. So who cares about what they think? The politicians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the poor have been ill, sir. Uh, our country has not done well with respect to its ability to generate dignity. And you generate dignity through providing an opportunity for people to work, for a father, a mother, a brother, a sister, to have a reason to wake up in the morning, to go to work, and to have the pride of earning something. So the number one priority uh, for the country should be um, an economic model that produces the highest number of jobs. Nobody... Um, likes the indignity of begging, the indignity of waiting for a grant at the end of the year. So I can understand when somebody is skeptical about a corporate that says uh, we, we want to do good because people have uh, done badly. I bought myself a, a set of uh, Brunello Guccinelli uh, sneakers and I bought them because I love what the company does. So uh, an Italian family, a family owned business, they say they want a return on their investment, I think of between 15 and 18 percent. Okay? If they make more than 18 percent, 
So either we're not paying our employee partners enough, or we are not paying our suppliers appropriately, or we are polluting somewhere and not doing the right thing. So at Investec, we have uh, our return parameters are bounded. We don't say we want to make more than this. We say we want to make between 12 and 16 percent in, in pound terms. If we make more than 16 percent in pound terms consistently, something is broken in the model. It's not just we we are smart. We probably are not paying our people well, or we're not uh, uh, putting enough money into into society. For instance, in our school, could we double or triple um, our investment uh, in schools, as an example? So yeah, the, the, the average person has had a pretty raw deal, but I'm not sure that uh, it's oaks like me that have contributed to that. I think there are basic things you can do to move the country forward. The number one priority has to be about jobs, and you have to tell whoever it is that stands in the way of creating jobs, you're going to take their head off. But then you need a clear sense of what it is that you need to do to create uh, jobs. It will be private sector led. The role of government will reduce over time. It will be investment led. I mean, of the people that, that are employed, the majority, a big majority, is in the private sector. Unless you support it, you created an environment where investment can be made, you can kiss jobs goodbye. Absolutely. But you need a leader, a group of leaders, who will be uncompromising. While I'm not uh, a proponent of communism, in fact, I think it's, it's, it's a lot of baloney. Uh, if you see what... But you must have been a socialist at some point. <laughs> I don't know. Because <laughs> they say if you're not a socialist in your 20s, you don't have a heart. And if, so you're still a socialist in your 30s, you don't have a brain. But to, be a, <laughs> but to be a socialist, somewhere you have to be occupied with the isms. For most people, you're occupied with just the desire to get a meal, a desire to get a roof over your head, a desire for safety because criminals are running in our streets. Uh, people in something like where I live, uh, you know, you come to my table, my dinner table, oh, crime. This and that. Go to Alexander Township down the road, or go to Tembisa, where the criminals run around with no sense of uh, ever being caught. If they get caught, they have enough money to, uh, to jeep with the courts. Yeah. So for me, you have to deal with the fundamental problem of creating jobs in the country. You need a leadership that understands that. You need a leadership that has uh, the backbone to say to their colleagues, this is the only issue that matters. Let's start with, uh, uh, with doubt. Um, as I said, I've generally used doubt as fuel uh, to encourage me to work harder, uh, to try to uh, make sure that what I do is what I'm good at and I can make a contribution on. So so I've always used it as, as fuel. Um, and I've generally made sure that if I got to a point where my confidence gets destroyed, um, I, I, I make a change. So if doubt overwhelms you to a point where you feel completely uh, immobilized, uh, you, you need to listen. I think you need to uh, to, to, to reconsider what you're doing. Uh, if I look at my younger self, um, phew, you have no idea how, um, I mean, only in uh, around 75, 76 as a, a person did I get an inkling that I have certain abilities. Because generally when you grow in poverty, all that you see, uh, is uh, depressing. Uh, and there isn't any level of encouragement. There's a big struggle uh, just to eat, just to, to be able to, to sleep peacefully. So the first time I went to Durban uh, in, my, uh, in my late 30s, if not early 40s, I couldn't sleep because a friend of mine, Anansi, the movie maker, has a, a house on the beach. And the sound of waves can be terrorizing. <laughs> if, if, uh, if you've lived in a shack, because when it's very windy, um, uh, the, 
the corrugated iron can fly away. You've got big stones that are keeping this thing. So when you think about these moments uh, where you come from, uh, you literally use your past as fuel to try to propel you to the future. My younger self was just too traumatized, I think, by uh, that childhood. My slightly more developed self as I got into the corporate world. I wish I was uh, a bit more patient. I got to a point where I became impatient. So I would make changes too soon, uh, even when I thought I was doing well, but I felt I needed to make changes too soon. So that would be something that I would look back at and say, maybe you would do that better, but I would never, uh, ever regret the fact that I, I was always hopeful and optimistic, coming from my father's um, own mindset and disciplined to understand the sacrifice required to be successful. So those would be the kind of thing I would say, okay, boy, you did well by continuing to believe in, uh, uh, in, in the future and say, goodness me, you worked hard for it. Maybe you didn't have as much fun as you could have had, but at least you worked hard. Um, on freedom, I mean, how, how would you define freedom? Um, as an example, freedom has to include the fact that you have a life of some dignity. Freedom has to include the fact that you can walk in the street as a woman and not fear that you could be attacked and raped. A freedom must contain in it a sense that uh, uh, you would be treated fairly if you went and you sought justice because something didn't go right. So our freedom is extremely limited. The poor really have no freedom. I know, as I said, we like to complain. Where uh, Professor and I uh, uh, sit and go, last night I went to dinner at uh, Hall um, in Hyde Park. Uh, I mean, beautiful food. And there's uh, my friend uh, Floyd Chibambo having a fabulous meal. I mean, this place is expensive. And he didn't have his... Even for bankers, right? Uh, no, yeah, even for bankers. <laughs> <laughs> Especially for bankers. <laughs> and uh, he didn't have his red overall, and he was having a fabulous meal. I wish for every South African the opportunity to at least to be able to not be given money to get a meal, but to earn a living, to be able even to go to a Kentucky and buy something that they can enjoy with their family. So I, I, I think we are not only unequal as a society, we are unfree uh, as a society. I mean, in my case, uh, I, uh, like every bank CEO, uh, you will have uh, somebody that uh, always is with you. You will have a bulletproof car. What kind of a society is this? You go to Germany, uh, you can find, uh, you could even meet uh, Merkel in the street on her own. That's freedom. That is freedom. We are in prison. We have to get the country working. Uh, and, and, and it takes uh, a government and it takes uh, a, a business sector. I mean, you will know the kind of interventions that we try to make from a business perspective, uh, whether it be um, in the energy sector, and we've been investing hugely. When we announced our results the last time, one of the businesses that uh, grew at the highest rate is our corporate bank, because we are investing in infrastructure, not only here, but across the continent. So we saw rates of growth that are multiples of um, uh, where you would think they would be given uh, the, the economic growth rate of, of close on, on zero. So there's a fair level of investment uh, that we make on an ongoing basis. Richard Quest asked me a few, uh, probably oh, four weeks ago on CNN, um, are you trying to uh, diversify and get out of uh, uh, South Africa? I said to him, there is a huge level of opportunity in South Africa. For my business, we continue to bank even a little lower uh, in the high income space, both in terms of wealth and bank. So we a big drive 
And obviously, at the high net worth end, where people are risk averse and internationalizing, we have a bank in Switzerland and we continue to help them banking and wealth with respect to them uh, working and preserving their wealth. On the corporate side, the alternative energy space, as an example, infrastructure, these are areas where we invest. But you have to have a half decent government. And uh, I don't think um, at the moment we are anywhere close to a half decent government. Here's a challenge uh, for most of you. If between now and May, you can get 10 people to register for election. 10, no more than 10. It's not a very big challenge. 10 people to register for elections. Let each one of us, as opposed to blaming others, take the civic duty of encouraging 10 people to vote. I tell you, the country will move forward. So it is not only on government, it is not only on business. In fact, they always say, we get the government we deserve because we either don't vote uh, or uh, we, we don't vote take this seriously, or yes. we vote poorly. So uh, I think uh, there's a level of investment that is on the go, but you need a half decent government uh, to be able to move forward. Um, we, I mean, we are excited about what we can do as a business and as uh, the banking industry and uh, as uh, uh, the corporate sector generally. But I'm happy to to talk to you. As I said, I feel sorry for you because, uh, <laughs> as you can see, uh, there's a zest for life at, uh, at the zebra. <laughs> the zebra place. Risk propensity. Risk propensity. Somebody of my background has no risk uh, aversion. Uh, I don't. Um, I was born uh, uh, in an abject poverty. We needed to do something to get out of it. So just a belief that you can continue to improve. So yes, we've tightened risk disciplines significantly. We've diversified our loan books. We've granularized those, those loan books, but we continue to be hungry for growth uh, with a level of discipline in terms of risk management. So I'm no less hungry today than I was uh, 60 years ago I was 10 years ago, I was five years ago. I really think uh, we have placed uh, in our care enormous resources and we can do with those, those resources a lot. So we, we are investing. And for somebody in my role, we have huge responsibility to exercise this influence appropriately. As an example, just to give you one simple thing that you can do when you have a level of influence. We've increased the salaries of our lowest paid from 180,000 over the last two years to 250,000. That's what you can do when you have power. Using it for good, making sure that you spread uh, the benefit of it, making sure that you improve the conditions of uh, uh, people's employment. As an example, we've been reviewing all contractors. You're in see, such trouble now because <laughs> I see lots of first-time job hunters thinking, yo, <laughs> 250 chief, I will. <laughs> What's your email address? <laughs> so the point is the following. We have to continue to take risk. We have to continue to have a burning ambition to make a difference. And if you are in any role of influence, Please don't just enjoy the benefits. Think hard about what you have and how you could use that. And by the way, our returns continue to improve, even though we have moved at lowest pace from 180 to 250,000. I really think that mentorship is important. Uh, just having somebody that you can talk to. When I look at my, my younger self, I told you that I feel that there were significant parts of my career that would have turned differently had I been a bit more patient. And generally, if you have somebody in your circle that uh, does not try to give you answers, but can ask questions, the best mentors listen and they ask questions and you make your own decisions. I think that really is important. I wish I had um, uh, a strong mentors at the moment. I, I don't have a mentor, but I have a, a shrink that I see uh, from time to time. 
because by the very nature of the work uh, we do, you're under significant pressure. Sometimes you develop uh, a sense of uh, uh, blind spots in your life or you, you block up the arteries of your mind and your heart. And I think it's important to, uh, to, uh, to look after your mental health. So I do see a shrink from time to time. I haven't been as disciplined in the last little while because I've been traveling a lot. I encourage everybody in the room at least three, four times a year to see a shrink. Not because you're sick, but because you want to talk to someone who will not be judgmental, someone who's experienced, someone who will help you, whether it be something truly personal or it be something that relates to career. It's absolutely important. Uh, so what we do with Investec, we have uh, a mental health uh, capability to support, to support our colleagues. And we have a huge mentoring program uh, that uh, goes up to the executive. We pay for mentors and we pay for, uh, for mental health. I, I encourage everybody to, uh, to do that. Um, I try to, to mentor people, but I run all over the world. So sometimes it's a, it's a bit difficult. With respect to hope, and the two questions are related, it's hard uh, to be hopeful if you wake up um, in Alex in a crowded uh, place and sometimes there's no parent to even try and give you hope. It's hard. You, know, you just have to, to accept it. And one of the most important things we have to do as a country is get to a place where the young lose any hope, because then we have no country uh, to live for. So uh, the work you do, the work that we have to do, is to continue to find pathways for hope. Entrepreneurship uh, helps, um, but in my world, I prefer for kids to get a minimum level of education and a minimum level of experience before they can go out on, on their own. In my own life, I went out completely on my own at 40 uh, because I had gained a lot of experience. I do understand that not every career will be like that. So everywhere we can sow a seed of hope, whether it be through helping somebody with uh, uh, a basery or helping them with counseling or just giving them a sense of hope, or giving them some advice on how they could have a, a, a business to sustain themselves, even though it may be subsistence. That element of giving hope is really important. Um, entrepreneurship beyond a, a, a scale requires a, a, a lot more skills, I think. But we have to, uh, to do a lot about township economies as, as well. There's a guy who runs ShopRite who probably knows the most about townships in the country. Uh, uh, Peter Erasmus. Um, he has a business that deals with payments. He can tell you how a, uh, a tin of coffee gets fractionalized in the fourth month, where somebody buys a, a tin of coffee and they can sell teaspoons of coffee in terms of fractionalization. We have to understand much deeper these business models to try to give a bit more hope. But it's a, it's a long topic, a long discussion. On the country, if you are not a little scared about the country, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> um, because uh, our trajectory is not good at all. Um, but here's uh, the mindset that I take. My mindset is that we have to get to a point where we know we're on a bending platform. That we have to do something and do it urgently. Uh, our current uh, leaders in many spheres of life, don't act like we are on a burning platform and that the, flat, the fire is coming towards us um, unless we douse it. Uh, so as, a, as, as an individual, as, as, a, as a person, as a business person, we try every single day to douse the fire to have uh, rays of hope uh, as we go. Uh, so the first thing we have to do, and I know I'm 61 and I repeat myself, Register to vote. That's, that's the first thing that can create a level of hope. Once we've done that, load shed uh, some of these useless politicians. Load shed them. Stage eight. 
<laughs> Take them out. Get younger people in. We are governed by guys in their late 60s and some in their 70s. No ideas about how the world works. I'm actually getting a bit too old at 61 myself. So we need to try and just uh, be civic and, and, and be active uh, in everything we do. I think uh, this election is important um, uh, to crack these guys out of their boots and in some cases load shed them. Get more younger people, people like uh, ZB and others, they have no constituency though, but they are, but they are better at their thinking uh, in terms of how we can move the country forward. 29 will be critical because if we don't get it right then, you get to a tipping point where uh, you can easily deteriorate into a Zimbabwe, where the courts don't work, where the economy doesn't work unless you are in bed with Nangagwa and his cronies. We can't get there. So each one of us has to do something about it. So scared at times, uh, but not without hope.